right. Well, welcome. We are here for the Fred Rear Real Estate Investor Group tonight. And uh, welcome to Tom, Brian, Rick. And um, also, if you are uh, watching this on the recording or on YouTube, please uh, make sure to press that like button and subscribe so you do get our notifications. Um, do want to start off with uh, talking about... Whoop, I guess I got a little quick here. Uh, we are the, the group leaders, Rick and I, and uh, this just uh, slide shows a little bit about us. We are both uh, real estate brokers. I'm a broker in Virginia and in Florida, and we're also investors. We do uh, sales and property management at our brokerage, and we have short, mid, and long-term rentals, and we started with house hacking. Rick, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and now we're heavily uh, involved in shorts, uh, doing short-term rentals, and it's been <laughs> quite a, a magical ride. Today was Popcorn Day, and we must oh have had five, six, seven bookings. Of I think we have like eight of them, actually. Eight? Was, was it like, eight? <laughs> okay, it was crazy. It was like popcorn popping, <laughs> and, and I guess, which is a blessing, because most of our our bookings actually are taking place in the evening hours. Like when people get home from work, you know, after five, six o'clock. And um, this is kind of very highly unusual to have them start to happen here on a Thursday at starting around 12 o'clock, they started popping. So pretty wild, but we're loving it. And it's kind of still, it's still, we're still in a happy place that we like uh, short-term rentals and the feedback that we get doing it. So anyway. Wonderful, well, it's, wonderful. It's, it's, so if any of you out there have any questions or need any help with those different aspects, we are your people and can help us out. Just drop us a call or send us an email. Um, also, we do have uh, the next Real Estate Investor Cruise. We have signed up for that for next year, and that is going to be the with the National RIA Cruise, since we are a member of National RIA and the Royal Caribbean Symphony of the Seas, February 2nd to the 9th. So I will send out some information about that if anyone would like to join us. So we'd love to love to have that. And um, we are moving to the 5 p.m. time frame. Hope that you guys can join us on that at that time. But if not, then we'll be sending out that recording to everyone so that you can have that and you can also see us on YouTube. Um, still the second Thursday of the month though. And our disclaimer for both us and Brian is the topics that are discussed here are for general real estate educational purposes only, and it is not considered investment advice. So we can help you in the real estate business, but definitely, definitely do your due diligence, talk to the lawyers, the accountants, everything like that, and um, definitely um, cover your own butt. All right, we are a member of National RIA, so if you wanted those National RIA benefits, you can get those for the cheapest price around of $70, because we don't do this as a business. We just do this to educate you and help you out if you do want those benefits. So let us know. Tonight, we have Brian Maddox, and Rick is going to introduce him in just a second. Um, on March 28th, we have the in-person networking meeting at Wegmans. And then in April, we've got Tom and Michelle McPhee talking about using whole life insurance. Um, and then we are going to be talking with you at a different time and uh, date from this about the ahas from the last investor cruise that we went on in May. Now, we're going to be in a different time zone, you know, because we are those travel investors. And um, so that's why we are going to do that at a different time zone or a different time. So sorry, I'm admitting some people. Um, and so definitely check that out. And then Wendy is going to be joining us again. She actually hasn't talked to the group in a couple of years. So we wanted to have her back to talk with us about financing in this new normal. The crazy thing that Brian's going to, the market that Brian's talking about today is going to be a little crazy. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to live like nobody else lives now so that you can live like no one else lives later. All right. Let me go ahead and let you introduce uh, Brian. Excellent. Um, so Rick, go ahead and do that. Brian, I wish I could give you hugs uh, through the computer Zoom. I, you know, they do thumbs up, but I don't know. I just feel like giving you a hug. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming to talk to us. And people, the best way to learn is to surround yourself 
like with successful people like Brian, people who've been through the trenches, who've lived it. He's got six short-term rentals um, and he is a very, very successful lender. So a little bit more about Brian. He's been lending since 1997. So not quite as old as when dirt was invented, but he has some um, <laughs> battle scars and he knows what he's talking about. He's been through a lot of ups and downs like we all have, right? Um, but he's lent almost 1 billion in mortgages. So that says a lot. Because, you know, it's, it's like an attorney, you want experience in the courtroom, you want Brian, who's done a lot of deals, because he's probably seen it all. So Brian is, is not a sole entrepreneur, he, he, he works with a team, and he's helped over a 1000 clients in just a few years, he's ranked in the top 1% of lenders. I'm I'm privileged to know him and and uh, appreciate him coming on our call. And he brings a unique perspective because he, he knows retail banking, he knows mortgage lending, but he's also a real estate investor. You know, he does the six short term rentals and we know how much time consuming those can be. And he's also uh, practicing the checkbook self-directed IRA. So Brian has been a member of several RIAs since 2013. So in dog years, that's a many years. It's like 30 or 50 years <laughs> but but in really reality that's 10 years of experience and he's and he's spoken in front of a lot of groups including ours before um brian is a master of the charts of information and he is here to share his state of the market and he's also going to cover what he thinks is going to happen with interest rates he's got he's got a, a very small crystal ball that sometimes gets broken but he has to shake it like a magic eight ball and it sometimes gives him guidance guidance that he can see that we can't see. Um, and he's also going to talk about updating the Burr method and the changes and guidelines that will affect investors. So please welcome. I put Brian's contact info into the chat function. Um, and we'll be also sending that out in YouTube as well, a link to his website and to his information. So please have me have a warm welcome for Brian Maddox. Brian, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me again. I think it's been a few years since I've spoken to this group. <laughs> it's been a lot. Yeah, it's, it's been, been a lot. Like I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember either. You're a repeat yeah, offender. I, though. I definitely don't have my presentation from last time I presented. <laughs> this is this is a new presentation, and I try not to recycle too much material. Um, but uh, thank you, Rick, for the for the kind introduction, and, and Anna, and uh, for the invite to to speak. Um, I, this is a passion. I worked in retail banking for 17 years. That was work. I left retail banking in 2013 to be a specialist as a retail banker. I was a branch manager. I was a generalist. So I did a little bit of everything, a little business banking, a little consumer, a little bit of portfolio refinancing, HELOCs, things like that. But I figured out that I was babysitting kids at work and I <laughs> needed to get, and I had four kids at home and I needed to get rid of some kids. So the best way to get rid of some kids was to go work uh, independently as a as a you know a, a sole salesperson, um, and so I got out of the, the banking world into the mortgage world in 2013, and and it feels like a vacation every day compared compared to retail banking. So, <laughs> um, so I'll let me see if I can share. Yes, I can. Let me share my screen here real quick. Which screen is that one? That is screen number one. Um, all right so you can see my screen state of the union or state of the market yeah state of the market i do see it all right perfect so hopefully this works out uh my family is my why this is why i work i've got four kids a beautiful wife we've been married 24 years this year um she has the luxury and privilege of running the short-term rentals so she manages those for us and then she also works for me very part-time and she calls herself my bad marketing assistant i don't label her that that's her self-labeled um self-marketing assistant so uh two of my kids have special needs uh they both have down syndrome and so i don't have a number i don't have a when i can retire because i don't know what their expenses will be so i got to keep going um, so I'll be working as long as I enjoy working. Really, if I didn't want to work, I think we could make it at this point. Uh, we've got six properties; they're income producing, mostly short term. We have kind of transitioned two of them to midterm rentals. We try to do month to month; it's, it works better for those and county restrictions. And then you can see my love, lovely hat there. I, I did not know that was in this slide. My wife made this slide. Um, so my my boy Chase here in the red, he does have leukemia, and we found that out in September. Uh, last year, 
So he's been in treatment for five or six months. He's in remission. That's the goal for leukemia is to get in remission in the first 30 days. And he inspires me to be a better human and to work out more because he's still going to CrossFit even five months into treatment. Uh, so he's doing phenomenal. And we're getting close to the, the grueling part of treatment. Leukemia sucks and it's a two and a half year treatment cycle because um, it hides. So uh, that's a little bit about my why. Uh, we're highly involved in Gigi's Playhouse. It's a national organization for kids with disabilities, primarily Down syndrome, but they do allow other disabilities in. My wife is on the board. We spend a lot of time there with our boys and then helping facilitate things in the local Charlotte. But it's just such a great place to, um, to advocate for and to be a part of, and, and really you can affect people. And then we're highly involved with our band boosters, and so you can see us all working in the background volunteering. We do a lot of Panthers events. We do a lot of volunteering at the, uh, at the games for the, you get a commission split of the concession stand. Oh. Um, and then of course I've got a, a self-directed IRA. I like to dig into guidelines because I'm an investor and I'm trying to find an advantage for me and for my clients. So this is awesome. I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, inflation and mortgage rates. Uh, there's a recession coming. We're going to look at household and housing inventory levels, foreclosures, affordability, and then we'll do some quick market updates. I actually didn't make a slide for the burr, but I can talk about it at the end. If I forget, just remind me because I forgot that I put that in my notes for what I was going to speak about. Um, but we'll do that in the market updates. Okay. Okay, so inflation. What drives inflation and how does that affect mortgage rates? Well, mortgage rates are determined by inflation. And if you think about it, when you invest in a mortgage, it's a 30 year investment and you're promised a rate of return. Well, inflation erodes that return, right? If I put a 30 year investment at 5% and inflation ticks up to 7%, it means my 5% is a lot less valuable to me. So as inflation ticked up, we saw mortgage rates tick up to match. You have to incentivize the investors to say, hey, this is still a good deal. You should still invest in long-term mortgages. Um, but the only way to get that to happen is that you increase what you offer to the investor. So as we see inflation uh, tick up, we're going to see mortgage rates tick up. And we can see that um, in these lines, the top line is the uh, is the inf the mortgage rate, and the bottom line is the core consumer price index (CPI). It's one of the government's favorite indicators of inflation, um, and you can see quantitative easing, this QE period. This is when the government was stimulating the mortgage market because we had COVID and it and it got crazy. We had a recession, and during recessions, we see stimulation from the from the Fed. So mm. that helped push mortgage rates down, 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 abnormally low. Rates bottomed out for the average consumer. You could have gotten on a few days during 2020 and 2021, you could have gotten a two and a half percent mortgage rate. We had never seen rates. We had rarely seen rates hit the threes, but we had never seen them hit twos on a 30 year fixed mortgage. We had seen them briefly on 15 years in the past but never on 30 years. So when people say, where are rates going? I say, I hope not back to 2% because the pandemic was nasty, worldwide <laughs> shutdowns. We don't want that, right? We do not want to see mortgage rates in the twos ever again because that means we've gone through a lot more pain and suffering. <laughs> mortgage rates peaked in October of uh, 2023 at about eight and a half for the average consumer that had good credit doing 20% down. We briefly saw eight, you know, mid eights with no points. And then uh, inflation peaked and we saw mortgage rates come down. So what is inflation? Inflation literally is too many dollars chasing too many goods. If I can't keep up with demand, the only way for me to slow down demand is for me to increase my, my, my sales price. If I increase my sales price, you're less likely to want to buy it. So now you're going to maybe think twice about making that purchase and it gives me a chance to catch up on the production of my goods. So too many dollars chasing too many, too few goods. So the Fed, they put the, the brakes on the economy by raising interest rates. That reduces the money supply. It makes it harder to qualify for loans because loans cost a little more. Um, it allows the economy to start cooling off. That's their goal. Everybody probably agrees that the Fed started a little too late. They maybe didn't start raising rates soon enough and inflation was kind of out of control because they thought, oh, this is transitory. This is caused because of mm. supply chain issues. Yeah. Remember all yeah. those ships I remember that. off the coast of, uh, 
of California. They couldn't, they couldn't dock. They couldn't um, deliver. Right. They, they couldn't were deliver. all. And I remember right. it was, uh, there was a, there was a meme that was going around that was like, um, it was like uh, Black Friday sales, and it had people on rowboats going towards the ship, <laughs> right? Because that's where you all the goods. That's were. where the product was. <laughs> they the weren't in the were. stores. So the Fed thought, you know what? As soon as supply chain issue, that's what caused inflation. It wasn't real inflation; it's transitory. It's it's because of things that have happened, and so they kind of, yeah, no, we're gonna let this go. Well, turns out it was real inflation that was starting to brew, and they did not do anything about it. So once they increase rates they slow down borrowing they allow the supply chain to catch up now you have a production that matches demand you don't need to keep increasing prices and so that's the market that we're trying to get into now inflation has been coming down month over month since october and it's still in that mid three percent range the the fed wants to see that at two they want to see the target at two so Recession indicators, what brings on a recession? One of the things that we oftentimes look at is GDP. So typically, and the definition of recession keeps changing with the politics that are in power and they want you to believe what they're selling you, so they'll change the definitions. But historically, we've called an inflation, I'm sorry, we've called a recession, um, when you look at GDP, two quarters in a row with declining GDP. So we're producing less goods two quarters in a row. Is it just me? Am I, did I freeze or am, are you frozen? I thought maybe I froze. You did froze for a second, but I don't know if it was us or you. So just keep going. All right. Keep going. Well, I'll keep going. So <laughs> usually we want to see two quarters of declines. Now, in this instance they name a recession after the fact because it takes a while to get the data from last quarter i don't think we've seen official qu fourth quarter data yet maybe we just have um, but normally speaking the data comes delayed and you don't know you were in a recession until you can look for the second quarter and they go oh wait that's two quarters in a row declining we're in a recession another indicator is unemployment so these gray bars indicate a recession and this line that's going up and down, this is the level of unemployment. Generally speaking, when unemployment gets to a low, it is followed by unemployment creeping up. So unemployment heads down and it starts to turn the corner, we have a recession. It comes down, turns a corner, recession, right? So this is a very common indicator that we're going to have a recession, really low unemployment rates. Well, we've been sitting at this low unemployment rate for a couple of years. It's been 3.7 forever. We just got numbers that said February 2024 was a 3.9. That's the first uptick in unemployment that we've seen that's meaningful in a, in a little while. But unemployment oftentimes is an indicator of a recession. Another indicator of a recession that typically follows uh, is the yield curve inverting. So a yield curve is looking at the 10-year treasury bill minus the two-year treasury bill. So 10 years is, is a long-term investment. It's actually what mortgages, the average mortgage lasts 10 years. So it's a 30-year mortgage, but the average mortgage doesn't last 30 years. Um, so projections and things are made based on the 10-year treasury and the 10-year treasury and mortgage rates move in parallel normally. In a normal market, if the 10-year treasury goes up, mortgage rates are also going up. They don't control each other, but oftentimes they're gonna move in the same direction in a normal market. Um, we have seen sometimes where they're moving in opposite directions and that's a market disconnect, but that's not very common and it's not current. Um, so if the 10 year treasury goes up, we're right now in the low fours, we're at like 4.2 or 4.3. I didn't see what today finished out as. Um, but every time the two year treasury, which is a short term investment, Every time that interest rate exceeds a 10 year, that's an inverted yield curve. And so you think about it, if you invest money, if I give you, Rick, $10,000 and invest, and I say, hey, you pay me interest for two years, usually you're gonna pay me less than if I let you invest that money longer term for 10 years. Well, right now, if I invest for 10 years, you're gonna pay me less than if, you, if I invest for two years. You actually want a short-term investment versus a long-term investment. So that's an inverted yield curve. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen often, but almost every time it's followed by a recession. So in 1980s, we had an inverted yield curve, recession. It corrected, it went back negative, we had another recession. Uh, 90, in the 90s, the, you know, right at uh, 1990, we saw the yield curve invert, then a recession. We saw the yield curve invert in, I think this was 2021 or 2001. 
um, 2008 or nine, that was the, the big recession, right? That was caused yeah. more yeah. by housing. housing. But we did have a yield curve inversion right before that. So it is almost every single time we see the yield curve invert, we see a recession. Now, these are indicators because something different has happened for this economic period of time. We had trillions of dollars of money flooding the economy into the U.S. Um, uh, commercial. Uh, people got all kinds of cheap and free loans. They got PPP. They got all the stimulus. Residential households were getting checks all the time. So we have so much money in the system that we don't know if these indicators will equal a recession like they have in the past. The government, the Fed, they've been talking about maybe a soft landing or maybe we don't go into recession. Um, a lot of market uh, movers think that that's crazy talk and that we're definitely going to go into recession. It's just how hard is it going to be a hard landing or a soft landing and how long is it going to be? Generally, recessions don't last all that long. And most of the economists I've listened to think that we will probably see a recession, but it'll probably be a short recession. But again, all the matrix that we use are, are changed this time because of how much money is in the system, which is a crazy amount of money compared to uh, the past. So what happens to mortgage rates when we're in a recession? We generally see the government stimulate. They do quantitative easing. They do rate cuts. They're pushing money into the system to help us come out of a recession. So generally speaking, when we see a recession hit, we're gonna see the government flip from raising interest rates to, to lowering interest rates. Now, they don't directly control mortgage rates, but that stimulus creates more money. It makes lending easier. And now we don't have to entice those investors as much because they're not scared of inflation anymore. They see the government is actively taking measures to curb inflation. So that gives you comfort and security as an investor for a long-term investment that I don't need as much of a premium. And so we almost always see interest rates come down during a recession. Okay, so we saw that uh, in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, obviously during COVID, we saw it in a tremendous way. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, we will see mortgage rates come down with a recession. Now, one other phenomenon that is happening right now is rates went up so high and, and they went up so fast that if you invest in a mortgage, you are scared that people are going to refinance this loan soon because everybody thinks this, this hike and this inflation was going to be short term. Now, it's turned out to be longer term than everybody thought. Um, but when you look at the difference between the 10-year treasury and a 30-year mortgage, on average, historically, we see 175 to 200 basis points. So 200 basis points would be 2% spread. Wow. So if the 10-year treasury today, it's at four point, let's just say it's 4.3, we should see mortgage rates around 6.3 in a normal market. But we still have rates in the sevens, and that's because there's not a premium on servicing loans. When an investor, when Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac buys the mortgage from a mortgage company, they sell it to an investor pool. And that investor pool expects to get returns on that investment. But on average, it takes them two to three years to break even. Well, if in two to three years, rates aren't lower than 7%, everybody's gonna be shocked because everybody thinks rates will be a lot lower in two to three years than they are right now. So most mortgages right now are not predicted to last two to three years. Mm -hmm. So a servicer is not willing to invest a high level of money into a mortgage today because you're just going to dang pay it off and I'm going to lose money. So mm. we have to increase the premium. Normally mortgages get about a 1% um, profit after it closes. That's the servicing premium. So if you take that away, if there's no value in servicing, you have to add it to the front end. So most of my investors, if they bought real estate since middle of 2022, they had to pay points where they did not use to pay points to get a loan. And the reason is an investment home is more risky. So it has a higher premium on the rate from Fannie Mae. We would offset that higher risk, that, that rate premium with a higher interest rate so that you didn't have to come to the table with money. But right now, investors don't want to invest. They don't want to give us higher rates so that we can offset the risk of it being an investment home. We can offset that with a higher rate. So um, right now, the average interest rate in America is in the, about 7.2%, and that's with no points. Average interest rate for investors is about eight and a half. 
So there's only like a one to one and a half percent difference in interest rates. We normally see the difference in rates between owner occupants and investors closer to 2% difference, right? If I'm, an, if I'm a homeowner, I might be able to get a 4% rate. If I'm an investor, I'd probably expect five and a half to 6%. So it's usually one and a half to 2% higher rate versus owner occupied. I don't have I, a rate in the nines. Yeah. I was going to interject and ask, is there a spread difference on government backed loans versus conventional loans? There can be a slight difference right now. Government loans are a little bit cheaper than conventional loans. We can oftentimes get into the sixes with no points for government loans today. That's not always the case. They, they trade on two different markets. So we've got the MBS, that's the mortgage backed securities. And then we've got the Ginnie May MBS. So it's a different pool of money. It's a different uh, investor pool that buys those loans because it's a different risk than the conventional loans. So yeah, right. it's a great question. Owner occupant um, loans versus investor loans kind of thing. Yeah, and you can do owner occupant on the Freddie Fannie side, but you can also do not owner occupied. You can do your second homes and your investment homes. Government loans are always owner occupied. Always, always, always. Or they were. VA loans, they if a veteran moves, they can actually refinance their old house and they can still get a VA loan if they're paying off a VA loan. That's the only non-owner occupied loan we can do for government is a refinance of a former primary residence. VA mortgages can only be done for an owner occupied client, but mm. a refinance can be done on an investment property, but it was their, their primary residence at one point. Gotcha. Yeah, good question. So right now we are seeing this spread in that 300 basis point. Once the, the market normalizes, that spread, the fear of refinances will start to go away. And so we won't have to pay that premium on the front end and we'll, we'll again see some premiums on the back end for holding these mortgages and that'll help investors buy houses with not so many points. I've had to charge as many as four or five points to an investor on a Fannie Mae loan. It's crazy. Before 2022, I always had the ability to go up on rate to offset risk. Right now, I can't do that. I actually have an investor that will do that a little bit. Um, and that's only been in the last two or three months that they're starting to have some no point options for investors come back. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about inventory and, and housing bubble and real estate values. Cause a lot of clients will ask me, is this a good time to buy market values are so high. We just hit new all time highs uh, in January for real estate, right? So all time highs, are we in a bubble or not? So I want to show you some, some data that shows, are we in a bubble or are we not in a bubble? Um, so everyone focuses on, 2007 to 2011 on new home builds, right? So we went new home builders, they lost their shirts uh, with, that, with that oversupply of inventory and they declined in their year over year production of new homes. So we have a bunch of years here. If you look 2004, the blue line is household formations. So think your kid moves out, they buy their own house. They just created a new household. Um, the average home buyer, the average first time home buyer this year is like 36. It used to be 33, but it's actually ticked up a couple of years to 36 right now. And when we look at household formations, we saw a slow decline in household formations. My next slide will, or actually is it my next slide or a couple slides from now, we'll kind of show you why that happened. But we had a decline in household formations, but we had an increase in house completions. So we had a supply and demand problem, and that's really what triggered 2008 kind of mortgage uh, crisis, right? It was a global issue. Um, you also got to look at underwriting guidelines. I could underwrite and approve almost anyone. Now, I was not in mortgage world in 2008. I was in retail banking world, so I did not do any of the crazy pay option arms or any of those really crazy products that let anybody that could breathe get a mortgage, essentially. Um, but for a number of years, we were out producing houses as compared to how many new households we were producing. And uh, there's a great guy and I stole a bunch of his slides. I didn't steal, I borrowed and I'm using. Uh, <laughs> his name is Barry Habib. You can see his pretty face up here in the corner. He's with MBS Highway and he puts out a lot of this data and I do like to use a lot of his data. But he had predicted this was gonna happen because you could tell that this household formations was going to decline. I'll show you a chart which explains that. But in 2010, 2011, we had a little parity. We were producing about the same amount of houses as we were households. And then we had a shift. We started to create more households 
and we were not yet building more houses because we had this shock and awe to the real estate market builders they they there was a vacuum of who was building houses and even today you don't have builders building the average starter home that probably most people on this call or people that are watching this video their first home was probably a lot less expensive compared to what the average first-time home buyer buys today part of that reason is builders aren't building those smaller houses right mm. we lost that with with the 2008 mortgage crisis. So now if you fast forward a few years, we've been making a lot of households, 2 million households, yet we're only producing 1.5 million houses. Well, if you have 2 million households created and you only produce one and a half million homes to live in, there's a supply and demand issue. It's the, mm. it's the same supply and demand issue we saw in 2008. It's just the opposite side of it. Right. So we have no inventory and builders are not building. If you look at 2020 and 2021, builders went crazy. Rates were low. Lots of people qualified. Rates started taking up. And what did builders do? They say, uh oh, half of my clients aren't going to qualify. I need to not be as aggressive in production. So they pulled back. We're still not seeing houses produced at the levels we saw back in 04, 05 and 06. Mm. Okay. Now, why did household formations decline? The average first time home buyer for many, many years was 33 years old. And if you go back 33 years ago, we see population. This is baby boomers, obviously were a tremendous force in the marketplace. And then we saw this sudden decline. Rick, do you know what this decline is from? This hmm. year is 1973 and there was a, a is that dramatic when, drop. Is that when birth control was allowed or roe versus wade roe versus wade okay roe versus wade was passed there and we saw a sudden decline of births and it it declined for a bunch of years well guess what was 20 uh 33 years later 2008 so we have a, a sudden decline in population, but we're building like people are still coming to the market, but they weren't. They, they unfortunately didn't make it into the world, right? Because Roe versus Wade changed that. And so we could tell that supply and demand was going to shift based on the average first time home buyer being 33 and cracking um, births in America. You could hmm. tell, you could have foreseen a supply and demand issue back then. So last year, 2023, we kind of had a nice peak here. Well, guess what we've seen for the last five or six years? We've seen short inventory and every year it's been worse than the year before. Well, guess what? Every year we've had more people turning 33 than the year before for a number of years. Now we're gonna go into a little cooling off phase here and then it'll start ramping back up. But this is not a dramatic cooling off phase compared to this. This is a cliff that we fell off of. This is kind of a rounding error that we're kind of slimming down. Um, so so you're looking at this when it comes to household formations, you're looking at this or when they're going to be a buyer in the market, look fast forward 25 years from this chart and you can kind of anticipate what's going to happen. 33 years. 33 yeah. Years. 33 years. Yeah. Yep. So you can kind of tell how many households are going to be formed based on how many people were born 33 years ago. Mm. So this is a good indicator, but guess what? We're starting off underwater when we, when we were last time starting off, we were starting off with an excess, right? We were starting off with an excess supply being created versus households being formed. Then we saw this drop off, but we were already mm. producing more houses. Right now, we're underwater a lot. We're, we don't have nearly enough inventory for the demand. So I this see. cooling off is not going to have the effect that this cooling off period did. Make sense? Great charts. I love this. All right. Average equity in homes. We're going to talk about foreclosures right now. So this is 2022. The average home in America had 58% equity in it. We have trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in equity in homes. I want to say it's something like $31 trillion in America in equity in our homes that are untapped. So when we talk about foreclosures, what happens on a foreclosure, Rick? You stop making payments. You can't sell your house. So you have to foreclose. You know what, bank? I can't afford it and I can't sell it. You can just have it back. So if we have this much equity, are we going to see a massive amount of foreclosures? No, probably not. No inventory. Let's talk about supply and demand. So 2008, 
we had an inv uh, a, a population of 300 million people and we had a tremendous amount of inventory on the market. We had 4 million homes on the market in 2008, 2009, a ton of inventory. Well, guess what the population has done? It has done nothing but go up, 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 up. Right. And guess what inventory has done? It's done nothing down, but down, go down, 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 down. Right. So now we have this huge gap. There's only about a million homes on the market right now. There's not that many homes, especially compared to where we were at the beginning of the housing crisis. So again, supply and demand, we're not going to have homes sitting empty. They're going to be occupied. It's something like a, a, a primary residence has like 0.3% vacancy rates and investment homes have something like a 2 or a 3% vacancy rate currently hmm. today in the market. Uh, and those are both historically low, right? We don't have any homes sitting empty. There's not a lot of, of, of houses sitting empty where back here, we had all kinds of houses sitting empty. Supply and demand. Um, here's what the media will tell you. Dramatic increase, foreclosure filings are up more than 150%. <laughs> so Rick, if there are 10 houses being foreclosed and then next year there's 25 houses being foreclosed on that's a dramatic increase right but it's still only 25 houses <laughs> right 15 more than last year <laughs> right so here's january to january foreclosure activity for the last few years 2023 was a little too new to get it on here so we did see a very very low in 2021 for foreclosures now we had a moratorium we weren't allowed to foreclose on homes uh for for many many places so we dropped to historic lows on foreclosures Pre-pandemic, we had almost 300,000 homes foreclosed on. I did find a slightly more updated chart that has 2023. This shows you delinquencies 30 and 60 day. That's the blue line. Um, and this is probably, it might be all mortgages or it might just be, um, it might just be non-government. I'm not sure where the NBA got this chart, uh, but I don't think it matters a ton. 90 day late payments. Listen, COVID you could go into forbearance very easily. That's why we saw this ginormous spike up mm. in delinquencies. It didn't report on credit, but you weren't current. So they're going to track that data. But you can see in, in 2019, all these quarters of foreclosures, the red, were huge compared to where we're at right now. We are not anywhere close to pre-pandemic foreclosure levels. And with so much demand and so much equity in homes, Yes, there will be more opportunity, but it's not a floodgate that's about to open in my uh, guess. And if I look at the charts that show us this data, I'm not going to bank on the ability to go out and find a whole bunch of foreclosures. 2008, gotcha. there was a lot of foreclosures, right? That, this was the good times if you were a real estate investor and had money. Um, not a lot of real estate investors had money because they were some of the ones being foreclosed Affected. on, unfortunately. Right, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. Um, so affordability. I wanted to talk a little bit about affordability. And I found this chart and I thought this was fascinating because all you hear the media say right now is it's cheaper to rent than buy, right? If it's cheaper to rent than buy, how come a greater percentage of renters are spending more than 30% of their income on housing as compared to homeowners? Think about that for a second. Renters, so you take the, the income, 20 to 34,000, and 80% of earners spending that earn 20 to $34,000 are spending greater than 30% of their income on housing. Over 80% home ownership, if you are buying and you're in the 20 to 34,000 income range, you're like 55% mm. of those income earners are spending greater than 30% of their income on housing. So I just thought this was a fascinating look at renters versus owners. And is home ownership really unaffordable? Well, as compared to rent, you got a lot more people renting beyond their means or right. it's just expensive to rent is my guess. Right. Right. And, and it, you know, what it's also revealing too. I mean, I, I think of the, on the owner side, you know, you have things will slowly increase. You'll have property insurance, you'll have property taxes, those will go up. And that's why the, the, the value is fairly flat to slowly increasing. Right. But on the renter side, you've got that supply demand equation and the demand is just, you know, high and right. people are not moving. And so, yeah, and there was just a supply issue. So, or, 
yeah, that works out better for landlords. So right. anyway, that's and it's we're building less houses, right? So there's supply less in the market. Yep. That's all supply and demand for rent. Rent is probably going to keep going up. I just read an article or a headline. I didn't see the article um, that said Charlotte rent average rent is on the decline. Now, is it on decline or is the is the rate of increase on decline? I didn't read the article to find out because media, you can't just read the headline. You got to read the article to see if they spun the headline as clickbait. Right. Um, and I don't I don't click into enough of the articles, but I would imagine if you're a homeowner, you can more properly budget your expenses for housing than if you're a renter. If you look at like a five year or a three year period of time, renters, you're probably going to keep paying more and more and more every year. Right. Homeowning, right. you're not going to see a drastic increase in your in your uh, cost. You're going to see slight increases with insurance. Some states worse than others right now. Um, so if we look at a house, two hundred forty thousand dollar house back in twenty twenty one at 2.875% interest, you would have about a $1,000 a month mortgage payment. Now, if you fast forward to 2023, we've seen some appreciation. So the value of the house has gone up and we've seen rent or interest rates go up. And we would see an $1,800 increase uh, to payment for a thousand. That's an $800 increase in your mortgage payment. That's 80%. And the media is saying, it's so unaffordable, so unaffordable. Yes, it is getting more and more unaffordable, but income levels have risen a lot since the pandemic. And if you were earning to qualify for this thousand dollars, usually you're at about 25% as a kind of a standard rule. So we use $4,000 income. If incomes have increased 15% since 2021, according to ADP, we only need to offset this increased mortgage payment it's only a 20% increase in income. We had a 15% raise in salaries, right? So unaffordability, mm. it is higher than it was, but it's not so high that the masses can't afford the homes. Now you've got to look very specifically in each market. I know Charlotte, it's getting to be a higher and higher income level to, to buy the average house. And I would think some of the more dense populous areas in the Southeast, this is going to be a true statement. A lot of places, you've got to keep going further and further out to find that affordable home, but income levels have almost kept up with the higher interest rates and the higher real estate values. So you have a double whammy of increases on this side. Over on this other side with income, we've seen a lot of increases um, to incomes. So it is keeping up. You don't need to see incomes go up so much as compared to the mortgage rates uh, and the, the uh, appreciation for the values. You just don't need as much increase in salary to keep up with um, being able to afford those homes. Mm, okay. So I kind of talked about, and I'll, I'll open up for questions on what we just spoke about, just in case anybody has anything. I've not been monitoring chat, so you have to help me out. I had a question. It was maybe five slides ago. Um, it was talking about, you were showing like recessions after an inverted yield curve. And I was curious, you know, because we started to see the beginning of an inversion here. Yeah, we started to see it in 2020, wherever that takes us, 2023, 2024, there's an inversion starting there. And yeah. it just looks like, you know, the predictability is it looks like there will be a recession of some sort, just looking back at these other inversions and other recessions yep. that took place after an inversion. So I know you were kind of describing this as, you know, we don't know if it's a soft landing or a hard landing, but it definitely looks like some type of possibility of a landing. And I know yeah. I mean, I'm hearing on the streets, I'm hearing from tenants, I'm hearing from landlords, you know, prices have definitely increased in the grocery store, people are feeling it. And I think right. that's where the Fed is reacting. And uh, anyway, I, 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 how long, you know, if it, it, if, if there will be a recession, maybe it's not if it's just a matter of when and how long. Is that what you're it's, a feel, feeling? Yeah. Is? On average, so I only went back to 1980 on this, you can Google a lot of these slides by just typing in Fred and whatever you wanna know. And there's probably a government chart to help you understand data. And they track this data going back into the you know 60s and the, and the 20s on some of the data. Um, but typically when we see the yield inversion, it's six right. to 18 months until that recession hits. And it's oh. almost, if you look at the last 10 recessions, it's 10 for 10 that we had an inversion with this barely, you know, I don't know if we zoomed in, if it actually got inverted or if it just touched parity. Um, but it's almost every single time we see a yield uh, 
invert, we see a recession six to 18 months after that. Inversion six to 18 started. months. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank and you. you see this recession on most of these, the yield curve had on, had flipped back over before the recession was technically triggered. Right. right. On most of those. This one it did not, um, but it had a double, right? So if you, if you think this was the main recession, it did get back positive. And then I don't know what happened in the eighties. I was four. So um, I can't tell you exactly what's going on here, but I'm guessing it's oil crisis time, right? But I, oh, I don't know. 70s, maybe oil crisis too? I don't, know. I don't know. I don't know what happened right there. Um, yeah. But almost every time it goes negative, we're going to see that recession follow. And almost every time the yield curve actually corrects itself before the recession. Right, right. And I kind of feel like I'm seeing that now in your chart. Like it, it's, it's corrected, but I'm still waiting yeah. for the hammer to fall. What I'd like to see on this chart so I could compare is when did the Fed start cutting rates? Because that could be why we flipped back positive. The rate cuts usually precede a recession. Mm. So rate cutting, when the Fed rate cuts, it's because they see a recession coming and they're trying to keep that from happening. We know the government is perfect in everything they do, right? <laughs> oh, no, yeah. wait, they actually screw up a, a fair amount. So my oh. guess is that we see this flip because we see rate cuts happen before the recession has technically been triggered. That's Got my it. guess. I'd love Very to see rate cuts in with this chart so we could understand that. Okay. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Oh, sorry. I have been looking at the chat and so there's not any other questions right now. So you're doing great. You, great info. All right. So traditional products for, for real estate investors. You can buy an investment home if you own less than four properties. You can buy an investment home with 15% down. Once you own four mortgaged properties, you no longer have 15% down as an option. You have to do 20% down. Okay. Now, mortgaged properties is the question. How many mortgaged properties do you own? They don't ask how many mortgages do you have? So Rick, you could have bought five properties subject to existing financing. Mm -hmm. So no of the, none of the mortgages are in your name, but because you own a mortgaged property, you have five mortgage properties. You'd have to put 20% down in that instance, even though there are zero mortgages in your name. So mm -hmm. it's how many mortgage properties. You also could have one blanket lien on four properties. That's four mortgaged properties, even though you only have one mortgage. So it's not how many mortgages you have. It's how many mortgaged properties do you own? I see. Okay. A second home is defined as a home you will stay in some of the year. Some is not defined beyond the word some. Some could be a day. Some could be a week or a month or a couple times a year. That's some. So if you purchase a property uh, as a second home, you do need to furnish it because you've got to be able to stay there. You cannot put a long-term tenant in there because that becomes very awkward to visit your property some of the year. <laughs> hey, I got to come stay on the couch for One a day. couple of days. <laughs> so the discount to the second home, right? That's just an awkward conversation. And generally speaking, a second home should be 50 to 100 miles away from your primary residence. It's when underwriting considers what's a second home, they're asking, is this an escape? Is this a getaway? So if you own a lake house or a mountain cabin and it's only 20 or 30 miles away from you, that can be a second home. But I live in Charlotte and if I bought a house in Matthews in a neighborhood, I'm not escaping anything. That is not a second home, right? It is very <laughs> close to the city of Charlotte. Right. So generally speaking, 50 to 100 miles away or it needs to be a destination. So if I live on the outskirts of Charlotte in Waxhaw, North Carolina, it's a suburb, I could probably buy a condo uptown and say that that's my escape. Even though it's, it's a probably only 15 miles away, it's a destination. It's an uptown condo. I'm going there for sporting events and shows and theater and whatever. It has to make sense. I did have a client buy a farm. It was out in the middle of nowhere, but it was only about 20 miles away from his primary residence. That counted as a second home. It's an oh. escape. Huh. Yeah. So you can do 10% down on the second home. Um, when I can, so in 2020, my wife and I, when rates were so low, I said, let's go get a bunch of debt. And she was like, what? And I said, let's go buy a bunch of houses, but I want to buy second homes because I can buy twice as many second homes as I can buy investment properties for the same cash. So we bought places that we wanted to visit and travel anyways. Smart. Yeah. Why not? If I, you know, so I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Gatlinburg is a place that we like to go visit. Pigeon yeah, Ford. Yeah, it's awesome. Why not buy a home there 
earn income on it, you're allowed to Airbnb and to short-term rent your second home. That is totally fine. You just have to be able to stay some of the year. So you can't put a long-term tenant there and you should furnish it so you can pop in and stay. But why not? If you have an area you want to go to, why not let other people pay your mortgage and you get to enjoy the fruits and labor and benefits of homeownership and appreciation? So I want to make sure I heard you correctly. You, you bought multiple second homes or just one second home? We have six second homes. <laughs> okay. Clear as day now. Thank you. Now, I got yeah, you. Okay, now, wait a minute, Brian. Why didn't you tell us about this option? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was because you were probably buying where you already lived, right? Well, we were going to live in it at that time. But, you know, we, we, we like to go to other houses, too. <laughs> as long as you're going to stay there, if you're picking up a property for a short-term rental, you're going to stay there to set it up probably. That can oh, yes. be a second home. That's beautiful. So, That's beautiful. So how long do you have to stay there again? Two weeks? Some of the year. Some is not defined. Just, you don't have to stay two oh, weeks. Oh, okay. I thought for some reason I read somewhere it was two weeks. Awesome. Well, you'll hear oh, people might be doing that sooner or later. What would you say? Yeah, you'll hear people make up rules, right? And some <laughs> banks... You know, if I'm a bank, I can have a bank overlay. It's my money and I might decide that you have to stay two weeks for it to count as a second home. That's a bank okay. overlay. Fannie okay. and Freddie don't have that rule, but a bank can create that rule if they so choose. Okay. That's called a bank overlay. They're just being more respectful with their dollars. Sorry? I said, I think we need one in Charleston. Yeah, that would be nice. There you go. Um, every second home can qualify as an investment home, but not every investment home can qualify as a second home. It's got to pass that sniff test of, is mm -hmm. this real, right? 5% um, down owner occupied in multifamily. Fannie and Freddie changed the rules on multifamily. You used to have to put 25% down on anything that was two, three, or four units unless you qualified for an income restricted program, you could buy a duplex with 15% down. Well, Fannie and Freddie both recently made a change that you can buy a multifamily property with 5% down as long as you're gonna stay in one of the units for 12 months. Interesting. That is a big change. Before you could only do that with FHA, you could right. do three and a half percent down, but you're only allowed one FHA loan. So you couldn't buy a second multifamily property with FHA unless you moved more than 100 miles away for work. Um, and so now Fannie and Freddie allowing you to move, you can move every year and do 5% down on a quadplex. Hmm. It's a great way to consider buying real estate. 5% right. down is a lot less than 20% down. Now you can also do owner occupied. Rick, I have a house that I bought with a family friend. It is in Matthews, North Carolina. I use that as an example on purpose. It's not a second home. I should have to put 20% down on that. But I put a family friend on the mortgage and she lived in the house for the first year. She house hacked and she rented out a couple of the rooms. So because she was owner occupying, she didn't have any income and she barely had any credit. But I was able to buy that house with her at owner occupied rates and with 5% down because she was living in the property for a year. So you're not going to do this oh, with a random Joe off the street. Right, family, right. Family, totally. Kids, niece. Yep. Yeah. Buy a house 5% down, put them on the mortgage, and have them live in the property for the first 12 months. Ah, college students, beautiful. are they going to college? Would you rather pay a dorm rent or would you rather own a home that appreciates and might pay for college for you? Right? Put your 18 year old student with zero credit, put them on the mortgage. They don't need income, they don't need credit on a mm. conventional loan. It's based on your income and your credit. Love that. So that's why I've got this 5% down owner occupied. Love it. 5% down family opportunity mortgage. If you have a parent that does not qualify financially to purchase their own home. So think mom and dad, dad passed, mom can't afford the house. She's got to sell it. She's on reduced social income. security mm -hmm. and she can't qualify to purchase a home on her own. You can buy that house for her. She does not need to be on the deed. She does need to live there for at least 12 months, but you can buy that for her as a primary resident with 5% down and owner occupied interest rates, not investor interest rates. Mm, love it. Family opportunity mortgage is not a technical term. It's kind of like the, it's just what it's known as in the mortgage industry. 
And I've done multiple of these where, and I got one client, he moves his mom every year. <laughs> I present down, mom, you're moving. I'm paying for it, but you're moving, right? It's way cheaper than 20% down. Also, you can always buy a primary residence, even if you have 10 mortgages. Let that sink in. So Fannie Freddie limit you to 10 mortgages unless you're buying a primary residence. So you can what buy a primary second residence. Home? Second home, you're limited to 10 because that's not owner occupied. So if you've but got 10 houses. 10 second homes or 10 total homes? 10 mortgaged properties. Oh, okay. Well, then that yeah, if this is going to be your 11th home, I can't finance that through Fannie and Freddie on a second home. I have to go non QM. Yeah. Yeah, but if I go buy myself or if I buy my mom a, a home, even if I have 10 mortgages, I can buy an 11th house using Fannie Mae 5% down money. Mm. And then we already spoke about multifamily. Right. I'm going to go over this slide really quick because I know we're right at six o'clock. So non-traditional products, you've got your four nationals. Think of your Canadians, your people overseas buying houses. We can do mortgages for them. One day out of bankruptcy or foreclosure. Now, it's not going to be cheap. You're going to pay some money if you get a mortgage and you're going to need to put down more. You're not putting 5% down on a okay. one day out of bankruptcy or foreclosure. No doc or debt service ratio or DSCR, which is debt service coverage ratio. These are as close to stated income as we've got right now, where uh, we're looking at the rental income versus the mortgage payment. It is credit driven, but if you can find a deal, and it's the, the bigger the house um, sales price, the harder it is for these numbers to work. And that's true for any investment home on a long-term rental. The more expensive the home, the less likely you are to cover the rent, uh, have the rent cover the mortgage payment. It's just mm -hmm. harder to do at a four or $500,000 house. Jumbo mortgages, anything over 766. 40 year mortgages, it's a 10 year interest only term and then a 30 year repayment term. So we can sometimes on a DSCR, we can do an interest only DSCR. If we're not getting the, the mortgage payment covered with our DSCR loans, then we can switch it to interest only to help you qualify on that route. Interesting. Non-warrantable condos are just condos that Fannie Mae will not finance. So the non-QM world or non-traditional financing world, we can do non-warrantable condos. We can look at bank statements, 12 or 24 months. We can look at P&Ls. We can look at 1099s. So there's a lot of ways to look at income. If your CPA is magic and shows you made no money, Bank statement loan might work. You might have tons of cash flow, but the IRS thinks you make no money. I can still help you get financing with that. And then okay. reverse mortgages. I could do a whole class on reverse mortgages. I love them. <laughs> well, there's some non-traditional. Now, Burr method, I don't have a slide made for this, but Burr method, the major change last year is that Fannie and Freddie now require on a cash out refinance, they require the loan that's being paid off to be 12 months old. So if you're doing a fix and keep, the traditional Burr method is you buy, you renovate, you rent it out, you refinance it out, and then you repeat. Well, you can do the refinance as soon as you're done renovating, you can pay off your hard money loan into long-term financing, but most investors want their capital back. I had to put 10, 20, or 30% down. I want that money back for my next project. You cannot do a cash out refinance using Fannie or Freddie money if the loan that's being paid off is not 12 months old. So mm. the loan has a seasoning period now. Now, subject to, can you buy that, that property subject to the existing financing, get a hard money second mortgage, do your renovations, and then we pay off the subject to mortgage on your cash out refinance. That could be a way to put money in your, in your pocket quicker. Or I have second mortgages on investment properties now. I've got a, it's a conforming loan, so it has to meet Fannie and Freddie guidelines, but it can be a fixed second mortgage on investment properties up to 70% of the value. And I have a non-QM second mortgage coming. I don't know what the guidelines are gonna be. I've been told it should come next quarter, so it could be April, it could be June, but we'll have a non-QM second mortgage of some sort to talk about in the future. Interesting. Interesting. So what's most, do you have a, like a most popular product right now for investors that they seem to be gravitating to, or is that like trying to find, you know, the perfect nut in a mix, a bag of mixed nuts? <laughs> That's my yeah. bad, bad analogy. 
it is, so there's not a best loan. There's only the best loan for your situation. Right? right. So if everybody's you can, situation's if, different. Everybody's situation's different. If you can verify income, you probably should go Fannie Freddie. It's cheaper. If you've already got 10 properties, you still gotta go non-QM. If you can't verify your income because you have a magic CPA, Fannie Freddie money is not an option. You've got to go non-QM. So right. I do a lot of DSCR loans. That's very popular with investors. Um, I do a lot of traditional financing. I do a lot of cash out refinances, even at today's rates. Do you know why? There's a, um, a tremendous amount of equity in homes. And if there's a tremendous amount of equity in homes, that is, that is unemployed Benjamins. Right. So if the average home in America has 60 percent equity and you've got a low rate at four percent, but you've got a ton of assets that you can't use to make you more money, there's opportunity cost. You're losing money by keeping your low interest rate. Right. Or keeping so it I in the a home. lot of cash out refinances. I'm putting money back in investors pockets because they're going to get more deals. And guess what? Two homes appreciating is probably better than one, even if they're appreciating with higher interest rates. Because the, the interest rates, your, your mortgage payment's going to go down with every payment. Your appreciation's going to go up every month, hopefully. Um, and so sometimes we get stuck on, oh, but I got a great rate. What's your opportunity cost? What are you losing out on by not tapping into that equity in your home? Also, I have a second mortgage. So sometimes, let's just do a second mortgage. I can't go as high on the loan to value, but at least I can put money in your pocket so you can go use that money to keep making more money. Great. So now so, do you see interest rates kind of pretty much staying where they are now? So we're probably going to see everybody's predicting Fannie Mae, Mortgage Bankers Association, National Association of Realtors. They're all predicting low sixes or high fives by the end of this year. So we'll, we'll likely see the Fed cut interest rates sometime this summer. Every month it's getting pushed back later because the inflation is not coming down as much. The jobs market is staying strong. So we're likely to see interest rates come down uh, from the Fed. Maybe June or July is kind of the earliest we think at this point. No longer is May on the table. It's only like a 40 or a 50% chance that we'll see a cut in May. But once we see the Fed start to cut, that's a stimulation. And they're going to usually uh, see mortgage rates come down because investors now are recognizing the Fed's taking action to fight inflation. So that's what triggers mortgage rates coming down. Um, I don't and know then we get fast. into this supply issue too. So interest rates come down. Now you got more people saying, oh, it's, this is the time to buy. And then prices go up. So it's just like, oh my yeah. gosh, there's a catch 22. Interest rates can be fixed. You can't fix overpaying for a house, right? T early 2022, the average home in America sold for 103% of list price. Right. You, don't, you can't refinance that money back. But if the interest rate's high today, and tomorrow interest rates are lower, we can fix interest rates later. This is the better time to buy with higher rates because there's less people actually shopping. Mm, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of less, a lot less uh, mode. You know, there's not multiple offer. I mean, there's still offers that don't get me wrong, but the, the, the original list price to actual sales price has actually come down to, like you said, it's not 103%. It's coming in at 97, 96, 98. I think it's 98 is the current average. So there's about a 2% wiggle room. And I'd always advise take that in closing costs, not in reduced sales price. It's going to be more fruitful for you. If you take the cash, if you're using financing, take it in closing costs instead of reducing the sales price. So where do you do your loans? Are you, what states do you practice? You know? Yeah, great question. So I'm licensed in 13 states, um, the whole Southeast, Texas, Colorado, California, um, Arkansas, uh, Maryland, Michigan. And I think that's about it. Virginia? And then the whole Southeast. Virginia, yep, I'm licensed in Virginia. Tennessee, North Carolina, and South. I'm not licensed in Louisiana. That's probably the only South or Mississippi. Those are probably considered miss Southeast by some right. people. Right, right, um, right. But well, Alabama, Alabama, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Georgia. Yeah. got it, got him covered. So you yep. hear that folks, anybody is interested and needs a loan product and wants to uh, pick Brian's brain, definitely reach out to him. That's our core audience right there. There you go. I'm, I'm yeah. licensed in Florida and Virginia. <laughs> And anyone awesome. in between, if you're traveling, you find a house you got to buy, call me. I'll help you finance it. <laughs> <laughs>
Awesome. Great information, Brian. Great information. Definitely. Does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask? Anyone, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or you can put it in the chat. Either way. Hey, Manny unmuted himself. Oh, okay. I was fascinating by his own background, by Brian's background. I want to, I would love to learn more or get some information about the FHA on multi or investing on multi. Yeah, it's, it's great. So three and a half percent down, you can use rental income from the other units that you're not going to live in to help you qualify. And when you go beyond one unit, this, the max loan size increases per unit. So you could go buy a seven or $800,000 quadplex with only three and a half percent down on an FHA loan. You can get up to about 1.1 million on a quadplex with Fannie Mae money. Wow. So you get higher loan limits with multifamily. And that's a, that's a, a high sixes credit score for something like that? Yeah, you could get down into the mid sixes with FHA. You can okay. get down, you know, 640 and above, you're probably okay. Under 640, it's going to be pretty difficult because there is extra risk on multifamily. So you probably probably need to hit the 640 mark. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thank Appreciate you, it. Thank you. Yeah. Give me a call. We'll talk about your scenario and your situation and see if that's the best way to go for you. Definitely will. Awesome. Well, Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. And it was a great, great presentation. We love hearing how what's going on in the market. It's been quite a wild ride. <laughs> there, you can't predict it's, these things. It's been a crazy 18 months. We've probably survived the worst mortgage industry that we've ever seen. In fact, 61% of loan officers who did at least one loan last year right. have not done a single loan this year. 61%. Wow. And 55% of those loan officers did not renew their licenses. Wow. So there's, there's an exodus of lenders. Just being here, I'm a minority, right? I made right. it. Right. Most, uh, more than not, didn't make the, this market. It's the rock much. stars are making it through the worst of times. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Boy, there's really there's really like, yeah, there's only like 20 or 25,000 loan officers that make up like 70% of fundings too. So like the, the people who fund loans are funding such a majority of what's actually being produced. It's the numbers are crazy. This has been a rough industry. Mm. We've, we're in a recession. If you're a mortgage or a real estate agent, you are in a recession. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Yeah, no, I it's definitely. It's depression for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's where, you know, the, the flip side is, you know, on the on the property management rental business on short term rentals, uh, we're on fuego. I mean, it's been strong. It's been running hot. We are getting huge increase. Well, huge, relatively speaking, we're getting increases, and uh, our occupancies haven't dropped. And so, it's been a, a mixed blessing to get us through yeah. these, you know, the rough times. Thank the Lord, you know. So yeah. anyway, it's just. But I, I hear your pain because we we feel it too. Definitely, we feel it too. I think once we see rates get back to the fives, so maybe the end of this year, sometime beginning of next year, I think we start to see the masses not afraid to purchase. But if you got a 3% mortgage and you call me and I say seven, that's more than double. I don't have to move. I don't want to move. I'm not going to move. And right. there's a huge amount of people that are frozen in their homes because they've got great interest rates. The fives is when they, is they the experts, think that we'll start to see a majority of those people willing to come back to the market. So I think inventory levels will continue to shrink for a period of time before rates get low enough that you get existing inventory to come back to the market. Good. Interesting. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for today's presentation. It's been awesome. And um, we'll be posting this to YouTube very soon. Hey, I love it. Thank you for inviting me and I will see you again. All right. Thank Take you, care. Definitely. See you tomorrow morning. <laughs> 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 All right. Talk to you later. Awesome info. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.